postdoctoral researcher at Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. He holds both an MA and a PhD from Dahlan University in Germany. His PhD work focuses on structure and functions of narrative in computer games and was published in German as a book in 2008 and needs to be translated for those of me who don't speak German um, or read German all that well. Uh, in 2010, he published a book-length book -length essay on intertextual references in Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons' Watchmen, um, which I don't care what language that's in. That was <laughs> uh, uh, and in 2012, he co-edited a, a volume on uh, comparative literature and comparative religion studies. His most recent publication in fall 2012 issue of LLC Literary and Linguistic Computing um, are a special issue on technology, didactics, and poetics of digital literature. Since 2010, he's been chairperson of the International Comparative Literature Organ sorry, International Comparative Literature Association's yeah. research, <laughs> yeah, <doesn't> matter. research <laughs> committee on literature uh, in the digital age, and I need to add two things. First, um, the most important qualification for me is that Hayo was willing to come to my class this morning and help me run a session of German board games, mm -hmm. um, for which he deserves particular commendation, because um, it wouldn't have been possible without him. Um, and second, the title of his paper is called Becoming Batman, and we'll see if he does. <laughs> Yeah, um, thanks a lot, Stuart. Thanks a lot, Richard and Mary and everybody at the Center for 21st Century Studies for making this happening. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be here. It's really, uh, really kind of a big thing for a small town boy from Germany to come to Milwaukee, which isn't that big a town, I, I grant that. But still, I mean, being here, that is actually something that I won't forget anywhere near in the future. So um, let me contextualize what I'm going to present you with in one or two respects. Uh, I think the most important thing to know about this talk I'm going to give you now is that it is neither an ongoing project nor one of my major research things. It's one of these in-between things that someone <coughs> asks you to do and then it evolves and evolves. So uh, this is basically version 3.0. For you guys, and um, I'm actually trying to do two things at once. Um, the full title of the paper is "Becoming Batman: Computer Games Intermediality," and that intermediality is something that I have had some furrowed brows about from non-Europeans. Uh, so I will give you a very, very, very brief introduction into what intermediality actually is, uh, that's a term that we use in Europe quite a lot, especially in Germany, um, as opposed to transmediality concept, a concept that you will be much more familiar with. Um, that is the one thing, and after explaining to you what intermediality actually is, I will try to explain to you why it actually doesn't help us all that much when trying to figure out how computer games and comics interrelate, because it's a concept that comes from literature studies. But now I'm already way into my paper, so I'd probably just get going. Um, for scholars like me with a background in literature studies, it's always tempting to just apply literary theory to other media. And uh, the early years of game studies especially have shown that that can be very, very problematic. And um, Liv House can put it in this wonderful terms of media blindness or text blindness. So you will always miss parts of what you're looking at. So um, some theories and literary studies purport to be rather media independent and uh, intermediality is one of them. Uh, Werner Wolf, one of the main protagonists of that theory, um, argues that studying relationships between different media is only possible from an outsider's perspective. And um, he takes this to be an expression of neutrality and universality, which I don't quite agree with, and I will try to show you why that is. Um, so my actual point is I will try to explain to you the core concepts of intermediality 
the problems that arise when applying them to non-literary media like computer games and comics. And I will then do a very sketchy typology of games and comics uh, and try to explain to you uh, by using Batman Arkham Asylum as an example why I think that this kind of thinking, this argument actually matters. So, um, I was very surprised about, when was it, about a year ago now, when colleagues uh, approached me for a very small scale um, German conference on comics from an transmedial, intermedial perspective um, to find out that there is no real big study in that respect, bringing games and comics together. There are some very interesting single uh, approaches, you know, papers dealing with, for example, um, the way a single game actually applies computer game aesthetics. Uh, in this case, it was uh, Killer7. Um, or basically um, inquiries into how one can explain the marketing of computer games for girls or for boys by looking at manga and trying to figure out how that has evolved over the years there. But as I said, I could not find a really substantial book length treatment of the topic except for German teacher's guide that actually tries to tell middle school teachers how to, you know, uh, influence their students uh, by using those new media. So, um, my main argument or my, ma my main interest is looking into individual and systemic traits of both media because I would argue that the transfer processes between both media and between every two media, the comics and computer games, it's just what I'm trying here as a test bed, are um, mutually dependent and even recursive. So, and now I'm coming to the point where I actually try to explain the stupid pun in my title, uh, the game Arkham Asylum creates the impression that the player actually becomes Batman by implementing a gameplay that is becoming suitable to the myth, iconography, and narrative conventions of the system Batman. So what I'm going to try to show you at the end is uh, that this is not an adaptation. That I think that is my main point. This is too far out to still use a term like adaptation with all that it implies. So. My starting point is there are simply factually a lot of comic books based on computer games and all that stuff is not some feelies as a colleague always puts it, nothing that you get for free uh, in your special edition um, uh, of some computer game but those are actual publications in major uh, publishing houses like Wildstorm which now no longer exists, I think. But still, those are all major publications. And um, on the other hand, you have, of course, the other phenomenon. You have computer games based on comics, on, um, on animated series. But as you see, I'm not talking about animation. I want really to, to stick to, um, to comic books for this paper because I think there are some major differences there. But you can see everything is covered here. We have uh, more or less independent comics like Sam and Max Hit the Road. A lot of people know that adventure game, but it actually is based on an independent comic. Uh, you have Franco-Belgian Bon Dessiné, like uh, Dres, 13, of course, superhero comics. All that is also presented in computer games. And my argument about those games is that they are not only comics themed, if they are worth their salt, but reflect in various ways upon the original medium comics. So, before I actually go into comics and computer games, um, let me just outline very, very sketchily what intermediality is. In the last 10 years alone, well over a dozen monographs and collections on the topic have appeared in both English and German, and I did not even look into the other major languages. Um, plus numerous um, individually published papers. And of course, that's also not counting the books treating transmediality, for example, expanding on, on Henry Jenkins's theories. Um, as in literature studies, as in game studies, 
there is much dissent and uh, not even basic definitions like what actually intermediality is supposed to mean are without any um, yeah, you know, different opinions. And I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of some of these positions. So you have actually some publications like those of, of Becker and Breda Busse uh, in 2011 and 2005 respectively who still use that term intermediality in that traditional sense in which it has been used in the US, I think for the first time, uh, as describing mixed media art. So art works that uh, resort to different media, which we might call today rather multimodal or plurimedial, depending on what kind of uh, uh, yeah, terminology you prefer. Post-structuralists have used that term quite often to describe something completely unconnected a, um, an empty space between different media which they are interested in, not actually a connection but a void. In literature studies the term has often been appropriated for much older and mainly uh, yeah, liter literary or only literary phenomena such as uh, concrete pro poetry for example. Even that has sometimes been uh, called intermediality. And um, yeah, and there are others. I won't go into any details. So um, the most widespread usage usage of the term intermediality um, describes the relationship between two media or media in general, but usually focusing on two media like uh, literature and images in Emden's study. I think it's that one. They are not high res enough to read anything or uh, literature and movies in Penakia Punzi. Um, the most recent, com uh, most recent publications, I'm sorry, most notably, notably those of Elistrom, Grishakova and Ryan at Herzogenrat, all of those are from the last two years, have done away with that kind of restriction and have tried to lay a systemic, if you want to, groundwork uh, with collections of diverse and very theoretically minded uh, papers. So, among all these current theories, what I'm going to focus on is uh, the approach developed by Werner Wolf and especially Irina Rayevsky, who is a close colleague of Wolf. And Rayevsky's book that you see here, Intermedialität, that is or has been for the last 10 years the textbook in German speaking countries for cross media relations involving literature. You will find it on practically every syllabus in German-speaking countries. So, to give you just a couple of definitions from Wolf. Wolf defines intermediality in a broad understanding of the term that, and that's just a number of quotes I'm giving you from him, uh, that quote applies to any transgression of boundaries between conventionally distinct media, end quote. Um, he draws on Mary Law Ryan, more or less, in his view of media and defines media as, or a medium, and now I'm giving you a number of uh, quotes in succession, a conventionally and culturally distinct means of communication, stressing that this means primarily the use of one or more semiotic systems, and concluding that media make a difference as to what kind of content can be evoked, how these contents are represented, and how they are experienced. So that is basically the, the groundwork, the definitions that Werner Wolf uses. And it's not terribly sophisticated, but it's mainly, um, I think the whole idea is to give people from a literary background the, I think, kind of important idea that media actually matter in the way that something is um, received and produced. So based on these definitions, Wolf develops an approach to relationships between media which has some overlap with Bolter and Grusin's uh, concept of remediation and Henry Jenkins' concepts of transmediality and convergence culture, um, which, as I have hinted on before, is kind of widespread as well, but by far not as much as intermediality. So while Wolf consciously integrates remediation in the more recent versions of his theory, his understanding of transmediality differs from Jenkins. He uses the term transmediality, but he uses it in a different way. When Henry Jenkins talks about transmedia storytelling, it is part of the larger phenomenon of convergence culture. 
uh, for example, in analyzing the Matrix movies and the whole franchise, he shows how the franchise has been created concurrently by different people in various media. Hence, transmedia, the creation is a transmedia process. Wolf would argue that the relationship between the various manifestations of the Matrix can be shown to consist of individual references, which can be found in each individual artifact. Each comic book refers in a certain way to the mainstay movies. The computer game refers by, by, the, by means of individual references to the other uh, manifestations of the Matrix franchise. So even though they are part of an overarching transmedial configuration, there is a direct connection between the individual artifacts, which would be more precisely identified as intermedial, stressing the creation of a connection instead of the negation of difference. So when Wolf uses the term transmediality, he applies it to media independent phenomena, such as meta-referentiality. That's his big thing that he always says. Uh, Self-referentiality is to be found in any artistically viable medium. In different ways, but that you can find everywhere. And he tries to identify these traits of media that are transmedial, that are to be found everywhere, to single out what traits aren't. So that is his usage of transmediality. It's just a step to find out what actually sets media apart. So that much for this meta-theoretical -the background. Um, what actually is being used in Europe is this. Irina Rajewski has used Wolf's theory to develop an ontological model of intermediality. She distinguishes three modes of relation between artifacts with regards to their mediality, one of which is intermediality as defined by Wolf, and that would be here on the left. Um, she poses that this kind of relationship across media borders is categorically different from intra-mediality, the relations between artifacts of the same medium, the most prominent being intertextuality in literature studies. Transmediality, again, that term, uh, the occurrence of medium-independent traits, in <laughs> the way Wolf uses it, it uh, is to her an altogether different kind of relationship in which the medium plays no considerable role. Can you guys see anything? No, you, yeah, you can, good. Um, so, our main interest and in hers is with intermediality, so she subdivides that ca category uh, into three branches which have pretty self-explanatory names. Media combination, top one, media transposition, and intermedia references. Media combination, of course, refers to stuff like um, illustrations in a novel. That would be her main you know, you have a novel that may have appeared in its first iteration without any pictures in it, and then you do a children's book version of it, and suddenly <coughs> it has pictures. So two media are combined. Uh, media transposition would be a movie adaptation of a literary classic, to give you just one example. And what is her main yeah, area of, of interest are intermedia references. Um, she here makes the distinction between individual references and system references. Individual references, I think, is pretty clear. If you have something like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, there is an uh, individual reference to Pride and Prejudice. The system reference would be to romance fiction, for example, or the works of Jane Austen, something like that. That would be a system reference. Um, and I will not go further into this. What this actually, s again, subdivides is the different ways in which these references to a system can be made. The, the gamut actually runs from stuff like, there is a sentence in a novel that says, and then they were watching TV. Nothing apart from that, just another medium is mentioned until uh, right at the, at the end, partial reactualization. That would be something like uh, Robert Coover's Night at the Movies, uh, where you have a collection of short stories that actually has not uh, a table of contents, but a picture showing um, the, the um, what's it called, the, um, the, the, the playbill 
for a night at the movies, at the cinema. So the first story will be the uh, commercial and the second one will be the animated short and, and so on. So the whole book uh, professes to be a night at the movies, something completely different. So that would be her whole range of uh, system references. What is important to keep in mind here is all this looks at other media from the perspective of literature. All these questions are aimed at I have at the, the situation of I have a written literary text that refers to other media. That's what this is for. I mean, it is kind of media independent because it compares different media, but it has a clear vantage point from which it proceeds. And that's actually my, my beef with it. So um, this media, again, is complemented by a set of five questions developed by Wolf to determine degrees of intermediality. And these, again, are very simple. The first, necessarily, is the question of which media are involved. Yeah, pretty simple. The second, often referred to as genesis, asks whether both media are present in the initial publication of an artifact or whether one is added later on. Um, take, for example, um, a version of uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. It's a book that had uh, images with it, had illustrations with it from the initial inception, but imagine you get a copy which has different illustrations with it. So that would be two, um, two different types of genesis. One would be the original images, the other would have been added later on. The third question is, which, if any, medium is dominant? This is, of course, a qualitative question, and it's difficult to answer neutrally, and therefore it is often coupled with the um, next, the quantitative question of whether media converge in parts of a text or its entirety. And being Germans, of course, um, our go-to guy with that respect is Wagner, you know? So Wagnerian opera, the Gesamtkunstwerk, that, of course, is where you have a total convergence of both media. They're singing their stupid lyrics all the time. Um, and so what you have is no dominance at all. Music and lyrics have the same importance. Um, the, the other extreme would probably, with dominance, for example, um, oh, let, me just, yeah. let me just get to the last point because I think that, that makes very clear what the, the difference is between those different categories. Quality, are the media contingent or interrelated? That again, you can see the easiest with music. Uh, take, for example, again, um, Wagner's idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, where everything gels together, it's all one big system. And on the other hand, think of folk songs, where you may have one melody that is used for different lyrics where you have different ch children's songs, for example, where you can sing a lullaby, maybe, or a fun song to the same music. They obviously have a contingent relationship between the lyrics and the music. It just doesn't have any connection. That, altogether, is what we use in Europe, usually, when we compare different media, at least from a literary studies point of view, so if I was from a media studies background, I probably would have told you something completely different. But that's what we use. Um, now, applying that stuff. First of all, the first problem um, is that digital media have the cap capability, obviously, to integrate other media into their code. You can actually have on a website, for example, a movie. Or a film clip, you can have music, all that, which <coughs> literature obviously cannot. So the whole relationship, the whole importance of referencing stuff has a different quality. It's not, not abandoned, but it has a totally different quality. Um, and apart from this media technological argument, the history, usage, and semiotic structure of media like games and comics differ from those of literature. The concept of adaptation, which even in traditional media has its issues, becomes untenable with regard to computer games, which is what I want to show you now. First of all, one can no longer identify a clear source, target, or original adaptation relationship, especially in Jenkins' uh, aforementioned 
transmedia storytelling configurations. In these configuration, configurations, it is no unwanted side effect that we can no longer tell which medium is the source from which all content it deri is derived. It is part of the setup. And if you know anything about Resident Evil, you will know. Historically, yes, it spawned from a computer game, but in the last couple of years, it has become absolutely impossible to tell if the most recent movie is an adaptation of the most recent game or the other way around. They are developed in conjecture. So there is no source target relationship, which is implied by the notion of adaptation. But even outside transmedia storytelling in the strict sense of the concept, adaptation is not really useful as a concept. Um, oh, there, it's concept twice. Before judging, for example, how Tomb Raider has been turned into a comic series, we have to deal with the fact that Lara Croft, both as an individual character and as a specimen of the generic model of the action game Avatar, has been inspired in her defining characteristics by the heroes of novels, pulps, and movies. All of those have been turned into comics and movies and some into games. And all of these cultural artifacts may have been influences on Tomb Raider and its comic adaptation. And this does not even take into account the ease with which crossovers between Lara Croft and superhero characters, such as the Witchblade, are achieved, um, which allows for the assumption that action game avatars are essentially superheroes, an assessment corrobor corroborated by recent games such as DC versus Capcom or Mortal Kombat versus the DC Universe, where you can actually be Batman and beat up Sub-Zero, I, I think it is. So, um, you know, that, that is, it seems to be one big Continuum. Synchronous relations are as complis, complex as these diachronous ones. Um, like many webcomics, Mike Krahulik and Jerry Holkins Penny Arcade deals with games. In the classic three panel funny format, Penny Arcade exposes idiosyncrasies of games, gamers, and the greater context of geek culture. This not only means that they regularly deal with comics also treating avatars and superheroes as equivalents. Um, so that's a nice one. Uh, but um, that they have occasionally produced official comics for games such as the Splinter Cell series, which only stresses the fact that the rest of their work, which isn't an official tie-in, um, resides outside transmedia configurations, again in Jenkins' strictest sense. Finally, Krahulik and Hawkins have co-authored a series of Penny Arcade computer games, bringing the whole cycle of games based on comics based on games full circle. Neither intermediality nor Jenkins' convergence culture, culture or, I hope you won't kill me for saying that, Walter and Grusin's remediation alone can explain this kind of relationship uh, and these developments. Putting it more abstractly, Comic-based games and game-based comics are the result of a process that is exponentially, exponentially more complex than that of, of adapting a novel for the screen. Instead of transferring form and or content from one representational analog medium to one other uh, equally representational and analog medium, both the analog digital divide and the representation simulation divide gets crossed here repeatedly and in both directions. One of my central claims would therefore be that it would be misleading to call this process adaptation. Instead, I propose to appropriate the term transcreation from translation studies to describe the process of turning games into representational media or vice versa. And translation studies has started to, to actually misuse that term in various ways, what it originally meant or was supposed to mean about 10 years ago when it was introduced was exactly this kind of process, the, the um, translation processes of games crossing big cultural divides, like, uh, like making uh, Japanese games accessible to a worldwide audience. You know, it's not just a matter of translating Japanese s stuff, subtitling that stuff into English. You have to do much more than that. You have to do a cultural um, revision. And that's why I like that term of transcreation better, although I hate introducing new terminology, but whatever. So there it is, transcreation. But 
How does one conceptualize such complex processes of transcreation? In 1982, when Gérard Genet was only just developing his system of intertextuality, he conceded that the methods of adaptation and transformation encountered in music were too complex to be described by a structuralist model. And for those of you who don't know him, uh, Jeanette actually was the one who did more or less what I've shown you, Rajewski's work on intermediality. Uh, he did the same thing for uh, intertextuality, developing all those different categories, giving us a really precise tool set of differentiating between different types of relationship between texts. And he conceded, as I said, in 1982 already, that with music, for example, this just does not work anymore. We cannot really tell stuff apart in that same fashion. You cannot make a flow chart. Instead, what he proposed, he didn't actually do it, but what he proposed to approach this kind of complexity was establishing a taxonomy of noteworthy artifacts and just ordering them as a series of parameters that would approximate a linear topology. So he imagined just taking noteworthy elements, noteworthy compositions, and just putting them in a row without actually, you know, making the claim that this was real theory. He wanted just to offer, yeah, a continuum. And that's what I'm going to do now with um, games and comics. So. Our continuum is very simple. We have pure comics and we have pure games. With pure, I mean, not some kind of virginity, but uh, there are obviously comics that seem to have no superficial connection to computer games. Most of them won't have any. And there may be computer games, or there are computer games, which do not remind us of comics. So that's basically the two ends of that spectrum. In between those extremes, one can identify any number of types of intermedial relations. I have decided upon nine types, but the framework could of course be coarser or finer as the assumption of a continuum implies that there is just a gradual shift from one uh, end to another with basically endless possibilities. To determine the location in which the various types are located within the continuum, it can be divided into areas of influence, which leave room for artifacts that do not use computer technology. That would be this corner. If I have a, a, print, a printed comic book, there is no influence of computer technology. If I have a digital version of a comic that I'm reading on my iPad, for example, then we would already be within the realm of computer technology. We have, of course, down here, the other thing, um, if I have a game that does not remind me in any way of comics, there is no uh, relationship to comic content or aesthetics. And, which is important always to the game studies people, there are a lot of games that are not necessarily narrative. A comic, however, will in most cases be narrative. I mean, there are al also comics that might be likened to, to poems, if you will, but most of them have a narrative component. As soon as we combine these reflections, we can distribute the nine distinct cases along the gradient, arriving at a simple linear typology. This typology is, of course, only meant to differentiate between different cases of intermedial relationships with unique properties. And all of these cases might, again, need um, dedicated approaches to actually probe them. I'm just trying to tell them apart. Some of the cases are rather exotic and unique, but exactly that is the point because they highlight facets of the issue that might have a bearing on other more widespread forms of relationship between the media. And what I'm going to do now is talk you through these nine cases and you can already see that pretty much everything is covered here. And that it's no, uh, you know, nine was such a nice number because I could have one exactly in the middle. Um, so the nine different types. First one, digital to analog transcreation, comics in print. What do we mean by that? Um, as long as one keeps in mind the additional complexity of comics and games just outlined, outlined um, existing theories of intermediality can be applied to this. We have comics, 
printed comics, which are basically texts uh, that refer to other media. So um, what do we have there are, um, this is just a very simple example. I don't think I have to go into that there are, the, the fact that there are comic books that uh, are just that, comic books. How can those comic books relate uh, to, to, um, to computer games? One, just one, to pick one case out of there would be, we could ask uh, about authorship. One special case, for example, is the game Dead Space. It has um, two animated movies as companion pieces, one a prequel, one a sequel. It has two uh, graphic novels as companion pieces, again, a prequel and a sequel. And the interesting thing about it is those five texts, if you want to call the game a text, but those five texts have the same author. So the, the game has a story author, Anthony Johnson, and he wrote the scripts for all of them. So we could here basically approach the whole thing, I would say, in traditional terms of intermediality and look at how this author references himself and other media because we simply have a printed text. I don't think that this case is particularly interesting. Let's pass it by. So where it becomes interesting is with digital to digital transcreation, the second case, uh, which I use to refer to digitally published comics based on games. So a comic based on a game which gets published digitally. The digital form of publication alone makes it necessary, I think, to distinguish analog from digital comics. But again, I will show you one special case just to make you understand why I think it really, really matters. Um, Metal Gear Solid, the digital graphic novel, is a piece of software that takes an existing computer game adaptation, so an existing um, comic based on the computer game Metal Gear Solid by uh, Chris Oprisco and Ashley Wood, and which had been published by IDW as a, uh, a comic book. And what this piece of software does is it turns it into a semi-animated comic book, which can only be read on Sony's PlayStation Portable. So what happens is um, this digital graphic novel is not platform independent, but has been released exclusively on this Sony PlayStation Portable platform, which means that this game-based comic can only be re read by gaming hardware, which uses an interface closely resembling that of the actual transcreated game. Yeah? So not only do you have to own this piece of hardware to, to read it, but the way you navigate through that comic is the same way you navigate through the game, yeah? which I think is kind of different from flipping through a comic. Type three, integration. The third type is the use of comics for narrative passages in games, which I propose to call integration because complete comic sequences are integrated within the mixed media arrangement of a game's software. Used this way, comics either replace or complement narrative passages executed as live action or animated cutscenes, or in rare cases, written text or radio plays. Especially in games which are modeled after movies, the use of comics as a narrative means is not noteworthy, such as in the Max Payne series. And of course, just the first two parts, uh, third part abandons that whole comics issue. Uh, the carefully constructed homage to classic and modern gangster movies goes so far as to call itself, in the case of the part two, a film noir love story, which is the subtitle, yet makes extensive use of comic sequences. So this is the game's actual graphics, that is the in-game graphics of Max Payne 2. The usage of comic sequences was originally an economic choice, as the developers have admitted, because shooting and arranging a photo comic allowed for a quick and cost-effective production process and the compelling portrayal of human emotions, something that the first version of the game engine in 1999 was not capable of. Nonetheless, comics in Max Payne make use of the medium's intrinsic qualities. There are near photorealistic in-engine um, cutscenes, which are only used 
to uh, four or four sequences that focus on action and surprise, while the comic sequences develop an emotional storyline and give the creators full control over colors, forms, rhythms, and metaphors, and enable an interplay between speech and imagery. This not only allows both game and story sections to play to their strengths, it also appears to be a conscious decision as it stresses the change from interaction to reception even more instead of trying to conceal it. And again, this is just to show you what I mean by this interrelation. You have the frenetic action of a shooter where you have a body count that puts to shame every action movie ever produced. And interspersed with that, you have these very serene graphic novel um, passages which are very poetic in a sense because you have this interplay of what is said or thought in this case the protagonist Max Payne thinks about making choices and being unable to actually decide anything and the accompanying panel to that is him driving a car on on the highway and seeing it from up top and you have all these branches but again it's it's a highway do you actually get off of it or how, how much decisions can you actually make and when it get it gets even more emotional the whole thing changes and you have then the forking lightnings again repeating that pattern and yeah so it, it forms a very very intense counterpoint to the frenetic action of the game sequences the representation of complete comic books as objects within the game world is something I call representation in this case the comic is not seamlessly integrated into the game interface like what we saw just now, but can be found and interacted with within the game world in a way that refers to its ma uh, material mediality, that is, its publication in the form of newspaper strip or comic book. When the player actually reads that comic, they are usually um, represent, uh, they are usually presented as integrated, that is, uh, in the way we've just seen them, but they still appear as comic books in the world. Again. Uh, Max Payne is a beautiful example for that. Um, throughout the series, there are frequent references to the fictional newspaper strip The Adventures of Captain Baseball Bad Boy, a cynical take on Charlie Brown. The newspaper containing the comic, advertisements for the comic book, and eventually even the fandom surrounding the character are vital parts of the game world. I hope you can make that out, that guy in the Captain Baseball Bad Boy suit. Um, it is even central to a meta-referential level of Max Payne. While torturing the protagonist, mafia killer Frankie Niagara muses, nothing wrong with a little laugh now and then. Take me for example, I love to watch cartoons. Cartoon violence is a fascinating thing. Eh? End quote. It's not too far-fetched, I would argue, to read this as a reflection upon the role of violence in games, which by likening it to the excesses of comic books or funnies, stresses its harmlessness and its cathartic potential. This is of course open to discussion, but I think that's what the, the creators want to stress here. Now we're at the middle of that continuum, at what I would call imitation. And <coughs> you will notice it's not imitation of games or imitation of comics, but imitation is a consciously ambivalent term because um, here we have an uncertainty as a recipient uh, about what we are actually faced with whether this is a game imitating the comic form or a comic imitating the process of a game. Um, as with other models that take such an equilibrium of uncertainty as their center, Todorov's theory of the fantastic is probably a chief example in um, fiction and literary theory, there may not even exist a perfect example. So what approximates a perfect example is the independently produced flash game Treadsylvania. You can find that on Congregate, the flash game platform. Um, it is as a game and as a comic completely unsatisfactory, which mostly just yeah, derives from its interface structure. But I guess you get an, get an idea of what it tries to do. You have uh, sometimes the opportunity to manipulate one of the comics panels and something happens. But yeah, it's not that great a game, but it actually tries to reach this equilibrium. You're not quite sure while playing it, if you're actually playing it, or if you're reading a comic book and you just have to do something, if that is actually play. So a much more interesting example is much older, 
but it leans slightly toward the side of games. Comics Zone from 1995, released by Sega, uh, realized the potential inherent in this category of imitation. The game's premise is that a comic book artist swaps places with the arch-villain of his stories and has to fight his way through hordes of mutants which populate his comics. Comic Zone's game mechanics are those of a side-scrolling fighting game and have some puzzle-solving elements, but its game world consequently exploits the premise of being inside a comic book. Uh, I'm in my comic book, oh no. Instead of rooms, it has panels, and instead of levels, the player has to finish pages. So you actually, you know, go through the pages, and when you end up in the bottom right corner, you've finished that level, that page. The avatar has to forcefully jump or climb across the gutters, separating individual panels, while the other comic book characters cannot cross them at all, and the avatar can hurt them by throwing them into these virtual walls. Some gutters are even destructible, and they burst into shreds of paper which rain across the page the same way a vanquished opponent do, does. Similarly, the, villains, the villain, the arch-villain outside the comic book, paints opponents into the game world, his hand hovering above the page, you can see that in the top right image, and remarkably, his hand is in black and white, so we have this real world of the comic book and the arch villain, the comic book character that has entered into reality, he is still in black and white when he is painting into that comic world. It's a real puzzler. Um, so when the avatar reaches the final panel, which we see here, it remains unfinished because the villain come artist has to abandon his work and re-enter the comic book world to fight the hero. And apart from e all these transcreations of comic book materiality, narrative conventions of comics are a formative influence as evidenced by the game progress being measured in a superhero meter. Yeah, you see it? He transformed, transforms gradually into a superhero. Um, it should come as little surprise then that Sega also commissioned a promotional comic for Comic Zone, turning the comic-based game into a game-based comic. So I think that uh, perfectly illustrates my point why that is again at the middle of that continuum. So, now we're on the game side of things. From now on, we're dealing with artifacts that are clearly computer games, albeit based on individual comics, in this case of analog to digital individual transcreation. This I lifted one to one from Rayevsky. One noteworthy example, which I had on a previous slide, is Trez 13, U Ubisoft's 2003 game based on William Vance and Jean Van Ham's comic book cycle of the same name. So, this game, in case you shouldn't know it, tries to do justice to its comic book roots by using flat colors and strong outlines for its game world, as well as comic panels and sound words as a part of the interface. No matter if one considers the result a success because of the movement within the frames, like those up there, um, they often look much more like split screens in a movie than comic panels. A comparison with Vance and Van Ham's books reveals that they are much more sober, realistic, and artistic than the game, which is much more cartoony than the comic. So this goes to show that the intermedial connection between, um, between those two media is always an uh, individual and a systemic reference. So, let me very quickly browse through the remaining... Oh, and there I have a German headline. Um, <laughs> so, um, system adaptations, I don't think I have to tell you a lot about that. We have basically two... They fall into two big categories, which you could, again, uh, do a lot with. You have these adaptations of, for example, stuff like games based on Marvel superhero comics, in some way or another, or you have an even more abstract take on superhero comics like Freedom Force or City of Heroes, which just takes the premise of superheroes per se and invents a complete new superhero uh, environment, a completely new universe. The second to last category would be pastiche, games that try to look like comics, and this always does not really work well on projectors, 
but this game actually crisis was one of the most photorealistic games when it appeared and one of the first modifications to come out for that user made modifications were a cell shader mod and you may be able to make this out with that those palm trees you have those really intricate original renderings and someone goes to the trouble of trying to make that look more like a comic for whatever reasons but there's just this appearance of being like a comic um, and the same thing we can find with commercial computer games like the Prince of Persia series which starts out in a kind of stylized realism and then at some point in time switches again to this cell shaded uh, visuals which have no bearing whatsoever on the series so this part of the series which uses this kind of visuals is n in no way more comic like than any of the previous parts and the same you could say for games like Team Fortress I won't go into that now the last category the most tentative of them all is appropriation what I mean by appropriation and Stuart has informed me that I won't have the time to go into that at all is um, what we usually do in game studies is approach games in terms of interfaces you know you click around the screen or you interact with an interface that presents you with information and you react to it it's an input output configuration so World of Warcraft actually resembles your word processor I would stipulate that there are a number of very great systemic similarities between computer games and comic books like the Yellow Kid and Super Mario they have a lot in common one thing would be what a German comic scholar has called the visual object das nur sichtbare Objekt this visual object is in comics the speech bubble you know the speech bubble is neither here nor there it's something that floats around in a comic panel it is not a part of the diegetic world it's not a person it's not a table but it is there it communicates something and if you look at how computer games overlay the the mostly photorealistic game world with stuff like pick up this gun or your your point counter a clock or whatever information that is very similar when you think about the way you process that and how it is integrated into a page so that basically that basically is that whole idea I wanted to put in front of you usually I would have ended on uh, a kind of reading of Arkham Asylum but maybe you can just ask me in the discussion about that and I will go into some detail I thank you very much and I hope you have some questions for me <laughs> okay. Let me first make the one excuse I have to make. This was originally in the paper, and it was so densely written that I, you know, I made a speed run through it in 30 minutes, and I now thought it's just scrap like on here and there. So that's why I kind of run out of time. Um, Arkham Asylum. Okay. In in a nutshell, if you know Arkham Asylum, uh, serious house on a serious birth. It is this very dark, very artsy uh, graphic novel, which has all kinds of visuals, but it does, does never look like a comic book, you know? You have um, almost illegible fonts, especially the Joker. You can almost not make out what the guy is saying. Uh, Batman is always reduced to this, just to this outline. He's just this brooding shadow somewhere in the back. He almost never has a face. And um, there are collage techniques and everything. So it is absolutely not comic -like. Its plot is completely psychological. If you have not got this book, pick it up and get the um, commemorative, I don't know what it is, 15th, 20th anniversary edition, where you have Grant Morrison's notes to it. And he actually explains, he gives a reading of his own comic book, which I always despise, but still. Um, <laughs> He, he reveals that the whole thing is modeled on uh, C.G. Young's 
um, ideas of the subconscious. So what Batman actually does when he goes to Arkham Asylum to the criminally insane is he faces his own fears, he makes a journey through the night and is reborn like the rising sun in ancient myths at the end of his journey. He can rise again much, much better than the last Batman movie. So, um, the aesthetics, I told you that, are, they are incredibly stylized and now if one wanted to adapt that into a computer game, it just would not work because you would not be able to make out what actually happens on the screen. You cannot react to something like that. And uh, it has all these levels of psychology. For example, the analyst of the Joker, who of course is the superstar of Arkham Asylum, uh, explaining that the Joker might not even be insane. Maybe he is the next step of evolution. He's just different. He is the urban animal. And maybe Batman is actually the same. So you have all these very, very intricate uh, psychological things going on, and Batman, about halfway through the through the story, becomes really violent. Not in the way that he usually is. You know, the supreme fighter who can defeat how many enemies. He actually pushes uh, some poor guy in a wheelchair down a set of stairs, and when he finally has his big showdown with Killer Croc, um, he who is or what, 10 meters tall, or in this version of the, of the myth, he gets a spear from a St. George statue to kill the dragon, obviously, but if you watch exactly what happens, he cannot kill the monster without hurting himself almost fatally, so the spear goes through his own gut. And this echoes throughout the whole novel, he will mutilate himself with a shard from a uh, from a mirror because he cannot face himself anymore and he cries mommy and Jesus, you know, the whole thing gets phallic and he has this, this mommy issue. All that is in this incredibly complex graphic novel. Now, what the game does is it has these slightly stylized but quite realistic visuals. Um, and how does it convey this whole thing about Batman's sanity or insanity? It takes one character that does not even make an appearance in the comic book, which is uh, um, Professor Crane, the scarecrow, and he feeds, as he always does, Batman some hallucinogenic, and Batman then has these visions where he has to run through a nightmarish uh, environment. <coughs> Look at that. The avatar actually turns periodically from Batman into the scarecrow. And believe me, if you haven't played that game, when that happens for the first time, you're scared stiff. <laughs> because, you know, your own actions become completely irrational and uncontrollable. You are no longer able to interact sanely with this game environment. So you are actually made to experience Batman's insanity instead of just reading a reflection about a man questioning his own sanity. And the game has all these strategies of putting you into Batman's shoes. When you are defeated, um, the Joker will turn up and, you know, make fun of you in all kinds of ways. But it's always shot like this. Batman is lying on the floor, the Joker is facing him, saying something nasty about him. And, of course, here he tells Batman, okay, you're a loser. I did beat you. But at the same time, he's addressing us. There is no considerable difference at that point in time between player and Avatar. And that whole thing about this the speech bubble and its, its systemic um, significance is very pronounced when you play Batman Arkham Asylum's um, instant action mode, which is full of these overlays, which are sometimes even uh, speech bubbles. And Batman, of course, he, he moves much faster than anybody else. And he moves so fast that he has these, you know, um, motion blur accompanying his, his moves and tell me that this does not look like speed lines in the comic. So, that is basically my argument about Arkham Asylum. Ah, yeah, and that's the final point, and I'm through. Um, in this instant action mode, which should be the one mode of a game where there is no story. You know, it's just like boxing. You have four rounds where you are pitted against the minions of, of the Joker, and you've tried to to achieve a high score, basically. 
this mode in Arkham Asylum is actually the one that is the finishing touch of putting you into the position of Batman. Because the only way you can achieve a top score is by fighting the way that Batman is supposed to be. You have to be absolutely circumspect, you never make any mistakes, you cannot button mesh as soon as you press your mouse button or controller button once too much. You lose your multipliers and your high score is gone. So you have to be absolutely zen-like as a fighter, as Batman is supposed to be, to actually beat the most game-like, non-narrative portion of that game. So, then again, becoming Batman. The game actually puts you into Batman's shoes, whereas uh, there is a, a scene in the comic where the Mad Hatter says, um, here, Arkham Asylum is a looking glass. You are us, we are you. So the comic tries to put you into Batman's mind. The game tries to put you into Batman's shoes. That basically. We have other questions. This Mary? Is, oh, this is specifically about that And this changes. It's actually um, reacting to what made you lose. That, for example, this um, refers to a new kind of enemy that you encounter at that part in the game. So there's some some guys with knives whom you first have to stun before you can beat them. So you actually get this taunt with its puzzling uh, connotations, and on top of that, again, you have to strength be hidden. Where's it coming from? I mean, it's, it's a video game con convention. You do not actually question that. Not while playing the game, but trying to figure out how that text actually interacts with you and the com uh, and I'm saying the comic and the game might be explained in terms of this switch Yeah, um, I thought this was really interesting. I wonder if you could um, could you return to the distinction between intermedia and transmedia because uh, I'm very familiar with, with Henry Jenkins' um, work and not. Uh, Totally unfamiliar with this European work. Um, it seemed to me that maybe um, we're making comparisons between two different theories that are trying to explain different things in the of first course. place. I don't recall Jenkins using the term transmedial, for instance. He talks about transmedia storytelling. This seems like very much more uh, a theory of texts and of media as, um, as systems. And he's interested in how stories can be told across media given certain industrial situations and certain desires and experiences of audiences. And it's much more integrated in terms of how it thinks about media being produced by an industry in which transmedia storytelling is an um, um, expedient strategy to make money and also for the, the audiences who experience media across platforms. So I wonder if you could clarify what, like, what distinction one makes between transmedia and intermedia. And it's, you're really even addressing the same topic. I think you've put it much more eloquently and concisely than I could. That was exactly my point. I just wanted to preempt that question of, and why don't you just use transmedia theory? You know, that, that, that is basically just my point, to, to point out that these different types of things address, these different theories address different relationships within media studies. That's basically it. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Can you talk just a little bit about the difference in the frame of reference and, and implications, genesis thereof, aside from geography? I mean, you know, Southern California, <laughs> uh, Germany. Uh, how is it, and, and how is it that, that Europeans are more interested, as, as Mike says, in, in the textual and systemic and structural? Yeah side of it, you know, as opposed to an industrial. Yeah, yeah. We have what does that imply? Yeah. It's actually, you can, can explain it from the difference in development of theories in Europe and in the US, I guess. Um, what happened in Europe, or especially I should say in Germany, <coughs> I can't speak for the whole Europe, obviously. What happened in Germany was that in the 60s, we started to have uh, the first people doing media studies in more or less that that way that came pretty much out of the Frankfurt School and was very much interested in 
how do media affect the public? What do media do <coughs> to people? The politics of media. And in the late 80s, early 90s, um, literature scholars started dabbling all the time in other media. You constantly had these books coming out by literature scholars analyzing movies, uh, TV shows, and whatever. And people from this media study, uh, from this uh, literature studies background, said, we cannot do that anymore. We, it's a disgrace. We have to have a foundation for that. But uh, European media studies did not have the tools. So they decided to basically develop their own tools based on intertextual. So that is basically, I think, the, the big difference between those two, two, it's not even two branches, but these two different philosophies. So what I try to, to convey to you is that this um, concept of intermediality, especially writers, these endless uh, slew of categories, is basically meant as a tool set for dissecting two texts in different media. And just to know before you make some blunders, because you ignore some difference, what is the actual difference? What am I talking about here, actually? And that's why I went so quickly over the first example of the the, uh, the the printed comic book, because that theory actually works very well there. If you can say, okay, I have this panel here where someone says that, and that picture is an allusion to this or that painting. It's all just, just texts which refer to each other. It's just intertextuality, which is aware that we're dealing with media. Does that answer your question? <coughs> uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you chose to bracket animation in the beginning of the talk. Yeah. And the reason I'm, and I'm thinking of, of something like speed lines, those are in comics and they're in animation. And comics and animation sort of tainted each other very early on in their development. So I'm having trouble. I'm an animation scholar, so I think about yeah. it's probably too much. But I'm having trouble taking animation out of this equation. Um, it is just uh, a heuristic uh, decision, if you will. I just wanted to narrow down my focus. So that's basically it. I'm absolutely with you on, on the fact that as soon as we have a computer game which moves, no matter what game you have, it will move on the screen. There is animation, always. But I think for this <coughs> paper, um, it's very important to, to distinguish between taking something that did not move on the page, that was a comic, and turning that into something animated, because you have more changes along that way than, say, um, making a computer game out of The Simpsons. Simpsons didn't run, GDA uh, parody, if you will, um, does exactly that. And I think those are just the, the source media, you know, use a term that I want to avoid. The source media are so different in their ways, they have very much in common, but still are different. The, the adaptation processes or the transcreation processes are dissimilar. Yeah? Peter? Um, I found your taxonomy to be uh, very uh, exhaustive and, and very complete, but I was wondering at what point uh, the questions of uh, ideology and politics enter into um, this particular model. I mean, is it kind of a, do you see this kind of a neutral way of, of describing media, or are there certain aspects that you would say? Um, perhaps carry different kinds of, um, of, of values and... and, and <coughs> of course they do. I mean, there, there is nothing apolitical in a way. So, um, what are you aiming at specifically? The, the theory, the, the framework that I'm using and its political implications, or what I'm describing? Um, I guess the former. Um, I mean, I, because it, it does you know, seem to cover pretty much everything comprehensively. But I'm wondering, like, are there certain aspects that are, you know, that, that you would consider to be, say, more, um, I don't know, aggressive, and other aspects that might be more, um, you know, challenging, and you know, and and uh, I don't know, I, I guess progressive. I mean, is there uh, a certain way of making sense of that taxonomy in, in that, um, you know, in, in political terms? Yeah, there surely is, especially on the side I blocked out completely. I mean, um, I did not actually talk about adaptations uh, about comic book versions of computer games. And there are fascinating um, examples to be found there. How computer games are used. Uh, for example, just to give you two quick examples. Um, 
which are politically, in a way. Uh, there is uh, Brian Vaughan's um, uh, Runaways, a series where Brian Vaughan tries to reinvent or tries to invent a new uh, superhero team for a new generation of comic book readers. And with what does he open? The first couple of pages are uh, Captain America and Spider-Man and whoever fighting the Hulk. And suddenly they stop, someone stops and says, hey, you're hanging completely out of character. And what is that? Oh, it's a new skill I just downloaded. And you, you figure out, okay, they, these are kids playing within the Marvel Universe, being Marvel superheroes. So you have this comic about future superheroes, which starts out with kids playing, being a superhero in a computer game. So that absolutely defines a generational rift, and is, I think, in a way, very political. Something completely different is what uh, Alan Moore does in Top Ten, where uh, you have this, this police precinct in a city that is populated exclusively with superheroes. So being a superhero is actually being normal. And um, someone is sitting around with actually a Game Boy, which is kind of funny. Uh, so with that Game Boy, and she is playing herself as a superhero character because she's you know, this figurehead of the police force, and they made a game about her. And then another officer asked her, That's great, they made a game about us, am I in it? And the playing character says, no, actually not, because you have such lame superpowers. I'm sorry, no, because uh, yours aren't so visual, they could not translate that. <laughs> Again, I would say, this, on the one hand, is a reflection about the similarities between games and comics and their perception as being violent and whatever, but it has this political component of what, how does that the one um, medium view the other one, and what does that imply? At which point in time on top of that? So it seems to me that you would favor the, those moments that really uh, foreground a certain uh, kind of reflexivity, that yeah. is sort of fostering a kind of critical consciousness. I think so. That's because, as I tried to, to get across in the beginning, all this starts with Bernard Wolf uh, making comments about uh, self reflexivity Yeah, so I agree with uh, Peter that I thought the taxonomy was really pretty exhaustive um, and, and interesting in that respect. But the question, I guess, what I was looking for here, either before or after, is some more reflection on the two media themselves in terms of their own sort of, let's say, specificity. So that, at least in comic book theory, one of the sort of standard ways of reading comic books involves the fact or the feature of the discontinuity from image to image, yeah. the gutter, and the need and the way in which when you read comics, what you're always doing is filling in, right, from one, from A to B. Whereas in a video game, what you've got is a world that is more seamless. Now, there are places where one might, you know, want to talk about gutters, whether you're talking about the cutscenes or things like that. But there's also then, from the, to the, there's that. And then in the sort of video game theory side, right, there's the whole debate which you more or less bracketed the question of whether, you know, games are, uh, let's say, primarily narrative of an interest or logical or whatever, and how that, that might relate. So I guess I was interested in a kind of, some sense of, even before you start classifying all of these different relationships, what does it mean to think about these two media together? What falls through the cracks in a way? What's in the gutter between comics and games that you know we might want to investigate? So. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I, that, that was a conscious decision I made not to talk about that because, um, as I said, cramming all that I had here into 30 minutes was almost impossible, and now I'm not even you know gotten through it in an hour. Um, I just stay away from that topic because it's so contested. Not the comic theory, I mean, that is pretty much settled. But as soon as I start talking game theory in whatever form, you know, with, with comic studies people, they might not even be aware of that. Where do I start there? Where do I start explaining? With media studies people, they often have, again, an approach that asks more questions about what does it do to people, what does it actually mean, what are its politics. They're much more interested in that. Uh, and when I presented this 
this whole theory at Malta at a workshop with uh, people from a background of both game studies and literary theory, that question never came up because we were kind of on the same page and they actually knew what I was talking about. But just by you know, dropping in terms like uh, simulational versus representational. Um, basically, going into that would be something that, if that was a book, would be my first chapter, the first two chapters. Yeah, so just to push that a little bit, I guess what I found, or just to sort of comment on the question, I guess the places I found most interesting in the examples were where the comic book, comic frames themselves, and the panels themselves, were put inside of the game. Because that seems to me to be this moment that, that does call attention to precisely that place where games and comics both uh, come together, but also are in a sense incommensurate. Because in a game, you're not, if you're spending your time making that leap from frame to frame in a certain sense or whatever, you're, you're missing something or you're, you know, then you're going to be uh, shot and you're going to lose your life or whatever. And so anyway, I, I guess I would be in, maybe just a suggestion. I think that one place that you could push this a little better or maybe open it up some would be to focus a little more on those moments as places that call attention to what is specific about comics and what is different about specificity of comics from the specificity of games. I think that would be an interesting place to, to open it. Yeah, you're absolutely right, and it ties in with your question from before, why I choose comic yeah. books as opposed to animation, because with I mean, animation, you wouldn't have that. With the comic book, you have a clear marker yeah. of the porters, borders of, of the frame. The frame the, so the panel is there, and that's a clear, clear marker that another medium is involved. Yeah. Absolutely. We may have time for, I'm going to say, one more question. And then, then my hasten to add, that it is my plan uh, to take Hayu down to um, Cafe Vonalberg on, on Downer. And um, you know, probably be there about 6 o'clock or thereabouts. If anybody who wants to come join us uh, and hang out and talk at, at greater length, um, that's what we do. But do we have time for one more? Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could reflect on whether there's any like historical evolution in this kind of relationship between the two media, because like, um, you know, these kind of taxonomic systems, which I agree were was very interesting and exhaustive, um, you know, invite the question of whether it's always been that way or whether the, as the, this obviously computer games as a newer genre have kind of evolved in a certain direction one way or the other. Because it reminds me, your, your image of the movement from panel to panel reminded me very much of my only excellent experience playing computer games of Super Mario Bros. or the rooms. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand, there still are sort of rooms, right, which are very panel-like. Um, anyway, so I was wondering whether this has kind of changed in the last decade, two decades. Uh, whereas with Richard's question, I could say, yeah, that's, that was a conscious decision. This I actually have not addressed yet. I, I guess half a year ago or so, I would have uh, said, yeah, I think it has evolved. Um, after finding one of my central examples, this comic so I did not know about that actually recently. That was 94. I mean, it's so brilliant, but it's pretty much alone in its, in its kind for about a decade. So um, I don't necessarily think that there is an evolution in, in that artistic respect. Uh, there are certain uh, technical parameters that have to, to fall into place to, to realize some of this stuff. For example, uh, having a game look like a comic is incredibly um, involved if you have a 3D scenario, because first of all, you have to, to render all that is happening in 3D, and then again, you have to basically re-render that as a 2D image. So uh, you have to have processing power to, to make that happen. So there is a historical component to that, but I don't think that it is on the artistic side. Well, thank you all for coming. and. Uh, Engaging in the dialogue, and anyone who has said it, it'd be about six o'clock to be down at, at uh, Cafe Hollander um, as the meeting, and uh, anyone who wants to come down and join us, we'd be happy. Yeah, it'd be really great. I would be looking forward to it. Okay.